Paul said, as we've just heard there, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Now, what is it that distinguishes the gospel from every religion? And the answer is, it's the grace of God. Grace yes. means something which is unmerited, it's um, unearned, it's undeserved. Wow, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time of the hour when you're watching this. Ben Fetcher is my name, and I'm excited today. Beholding Christ is the show, and this is Wema TV. And I'm excited today that uh, this is an awesome, beautiful day that the Lord has made for us so that we can have an awesome time to understand and to delve into the gospel of Christ. And as usual, uh, stay tuned because this is awesome, and uh, we are going to have the best of time. So you can call your friends, invite everyone that you know that can be part of this telecast and let them let them join us in this telecast so that we can have a wonderful time together. And I want us to pray so that we can start off this day. And today I have good news for you because I'm not alone. But let us pray first. Uh -huh. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so delighted this wonderful day. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for this, uh, for giving us this opportunity to uh, have a moment with our viewers today and share the gospel of Christ to them. We thank you that today you have planned good things for us and we are very yet, uh, ready to receive from your table, oh God, because you love us and you know us from the deepest part of our hearts. And we are yielded to your spirit that you may minister to us. And it is in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Every believer say, Amen, Amen, Amen. So today I say that I'm not alone. Uh, as usual, you know, I've been sharing with you in Beholding Christ program alone, but today I'm excited that I'm not alone. I have a guest, and this guest comes all the way from Australia. And I want to introduce him, and uh, then we'll take it up from there in the name of Jesus. So my guest today is none other but Pastor Ken Leg, all the way from Australia. God bless you, Ben. Thank you, thank you. Good to be with you. Here in Kenya, we say Karibu Sana. Okay. It means welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. Karibu Sana. Yeah. So how is Australia, and how are you? Maybe you can in, uh, introduce yourself so yeah, that you sure. can kick it off. Well, my name is Ken Legg, as you've just said, and I, I come from Australia. I was born in the UK, mm -hmm. but moved to Australia in the 1980s, late 1980s. And I've been ministering the gospel for over 50 years now, Ben. Wow, 50 and years. And I love it, love every moment of it, because it's the most rewarding thing to me. Wow. And uh, Austra how is Australia now? Very similar to Nairobi, actually, temperature-wise, okay. very similar. Okay. So I feel at home. Oh, wow. Yeah. We are very happy to have you here in Kenya. Thanks. And we are excited. We know of the conferences that have been going on in Kenya, the yeah. Manifest Grace Conferences, and we are so much excited about it. So you've said you've been preaching the gospel for the last 50 years. Yeah. And that is awesome. That is awesome. Uh, my, viewers, my viewers, you can hear that he has been ministering the gospel for the last 50, 50 good years. And uh, my God, that is awesome. That is awesome. So today we have uh, an interesting topic that I would like us to uh, share in the next few minutes and uh, I want to bring it in form of a question because uh, we have been into a place where uh, people no longer know what the gospel is. Mm. People are confused. Mm. People have been into places where they are taught to buy things, some of them, especially here in Kenya. We have mm. places we have been taught to buy oil, to buy brooms, to sweep out the demons. We've been in places where we've been taught so many things. And I can tell you, as my viewers are watching me right now, most of them are confused. Most of them are not even attending churches anymore mm. because they feel like, uh, you know, there is this verse where Jesus said, come unto me, that ye that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Yeah. But most people have been wondering, and you can attest that, my viewer, that most people have been wondering, Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. But what they experienced when they came to church, when they, they came to church, mm -hmm. what they received was not rest. Yeah. They received other burdens. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, feels like, uh, I think it was better off even when I stayed at home without coming to church. <laughs> it looks like the church burdens me. Mm -hmm. So my question today, Pastor Ken, is... Uh, what really is the gospel? Yeah. What really is the gospel? I, I would like to, to read a verse in the book of Romans chapter 1. Mm. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Maybe this will drive our conversation. Mm. And this is a, a writing by Apostle Paul. 
where Paul says in Romans chapter 1 from verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Mm. So uh, I want us, I want you for, uh, for, some, for some few minutes to take us out. To take us through this this uh, this thing he calls the gospel, yeah. because most people are lost; they don't know what mm. the gospel. And yeah. I would like, by the end of this show, the true gospel to stand up. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Well, Ben, I don't think you could have asked a more important question than that. And uh, I would say to you, and also to our viewers today, that Paul said, as we've just heard there, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are teaching, as you've intimated, that the power of God is to be found in other things, making sacrifices, sowing seeds, fasting, praying, and so on. But people do these things and they don't feel any more power in their yeah. lives. Yeah. Because God said that the power is in the gospel. Mm -hmm. So when we believe the gospel, the true gospel, the gospel as we see it in the scriptures, then God's power begins to work in our lives. So we see changes taking place. We see God's grace upon us to, yeah. to do what we cannot do in our own strength. But it's by believing the true gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, Ben, you mentioned about a lot of things that are being replaced or, or are seeking to, be, uh, to replace the gospel. And I've been coming to Africa now since 2006 yeah. uh, to various countries. And I'm very much aware of what you're saying. And I know that our viewers are. And I have to say this, that the number one enemy of the gospel is religion. Wow. Uh, because it, it pretends to be the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, it pretends to represent God. Mm -hmm. And so when people taste it, they don't like it. They get inoculated against it. Mm -hmm. And they say, I don't want that. And they back right away. They think they're backing away from God and the gospel. But what they're backing away from is the counterfeit that was offered in its place. Yeah. So really, relig religion is the number one enemy of the gospel. In fact, it's Satan's masterpiece. Wow. I'd have to use that term. It's his masterpiece mm -hmm. because he's done such damage with religion. Wow. Yeah. So so the number one enemy of the gospel is religion. Is religion, without a doubt. Uh, but most of us have grown up knowing that uh, Christianity is a religion like any other. So how can we differentiate between religion now yeah. and the gospel? What is the, the yeah. main difference? How can we differentiate the two? That's a very good question. First of all, Christianity is not a religion. Mm -hmm. uh, people call it a religion, but Jesus didn't come to start another religion. Wow. He said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So he didn't come to start yet another religion. Mm -hmm. He came to give us life through the power of the gospel. Yes. Now, what is it that distinguishes the gospel from every religion? And the answer is, it's the grace of God. Oh, wow. The grace of God makes our Christian faith unique mm -hmm. yeah. because every religion is about what we are trying to do for God to get him to like us, mm -hmm. to get him to bless us, to get him to accept us. And so we offer things, we make sacrifices, we do all these things, but that doesn't do it. That doesn't get us there. Yeah. It's not what we do for God. It's not what we do here. But it's what he did there at the cross oh, wow. that Amazing. brings us to God. Amazing. And that's, we, we call that the grace of God. Grace yes. means something which is unmerited. It's um, unearned. It's undeserved. You don't have to work for me. No, in fact, the more undeserving, the more qualified you are. <laughs> wow. So I can put my hand up and say, I qualify because I'm undeserving for this amazing grace of God. Mm -hmm. It's what God has done for us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. And we know that um, on the cross, what we call the great exchange took place. God took our sin, all of our sin, incidentally, our past, present and future sin, and laid it upon his son. And Jesus bore the full judgment, the full wrath of God in himself on the cross. Mm -hmm. But in exchange... He gave us his righteousness. Wow. Now, that's not a bad deal. <laughs> I call that a good deal. It's a divine uh, exchange. The divine exchange. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin mm -hmm. to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ him. Jesus. That's the divine exchange. That's the gospel. The gospel, by the way, Ben, as you know very well, means good news. So if what you're hearing is not good news. It's not the gospel. Yeah. Now, Ben mentioned just uh, previously that 
sometimes you go to church happy <laughs> and yeah. you go home sad. One lady said to me, uh, you know, I used to go to churches uh, full of happiness. I always came home depressed. <laughs> but this church is different, she said. I go home, I come to church sometimes depressed, but I always go home happy. Rejoice. And that's because Jesus said, my yoke is easy. Mm -hmm. My burden is light. Mm -hmm. So if you're carrying a burden that's very heavy for you, it's either a self-imposed burden or it's an, a burden that has been imposed upon you by someone else. But it's not his yoke and it's not his burden because his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Wow. Mm. Uh, in that, in that uh, statement, you've said something that is very provocative and very uh, arousing, especially in our, in our religious mindsets. You yeah. said that uh, in the gospel, we have received forgiveness. And mm. you mentioned past, present, and future. Yeah. And uh, mostly because we've been around, whenever we talk about that our sins have been forgiven, when you say past, no one has a problem. Mm. When you say our present sins have been forgiven, no one has a problem <laughs> with that. But when you say our future sins have been forgiven, they say that now you are giving people licenses to sin. Yeah. So how can you, how can you help uh, men to understand that their future sins have been forgiven? Forgiven. Yeah, well, Ben, I would say this. You better believe that all your future sins are forgiven because yeah. Jesus is not coming back again <laughs> to die for your future sins. Yeah. In fact, how many of your sins were future when Jesus died? They were all future. Oh, all of them. Born. Yeah. <laughs> and so Jesus is the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. The question is, when, when will we receive him? When we receive him, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. Yeah. We're cleansed from all our sins. The book of Hebrews puts it this way. He made one sacrifice once forever, and he's perfected us by that sacrifice. He has perfected forever those who have been set apart for God. So we are now complete in Christ. All our sins have been forgiven, and righteousness has been imputed to us. Wow. Yeah. And I know still on that area of sin, mm. we cannot do away, we cannot find a completely deal with the issue of sin without uh, mentioning 1 John 1, 9. Yeah. 1 John 1, 9, it says yeah. that if you confess <laughs> your sins, because everyone <clears throat> believes that uh, I have to, con my sins may not be fully forgiven, yeah. maybe I have to confess them daily, and uh, my confession makes God to forgive me in installments. Yeah. What do you say about 1 John 1, 9? Well, man, it's interesting that you brought that verse up, because everyone that says we have to confess our sins, goes to that verse. Why do they go to that verse? Because it's the only verse after the cross that says we have to confess sins. The only verse in the, all, the whole of the New Testament. Now remember the New Covenant didn't start at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Wow. It started at the cross. When Jesus said it's finished, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. The new and living way was made for us to come into the presence of God. And so from that time forward, we're living in the new covenant. Now, the question is, what about 1 John chapter 1, verse 9? Yeah. And we have this saying, I'm sure you've heard it, context is king. Mm -hmm. We must always study the context. John was the last apostle to write in the scriptures. He wrote at the end of the first century. Now, at this time, a heresy was coming into the church called Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Gnosticism believed that there was a division between the material or the physical and the spiritual, okay? So the spiritual is good, the material is not. And so they, they despised the body. Yeah. They despised it. Yeah. In fact, they didn't even believe that Jesus came in the flesh mm -hmm. because they said he wouldn't, he wouldn't stoop that low as to come in, in a, you know, an earthly body. So John has to say, if anyone uh, says that Jesus did not come in the flesh, he's the Antichrist, he's an Antichrist. Yeah. You know, he says that because they were saying that. Uh, they were saying there's no resurrection of the body. They wouldn't want this body to be resurrected. They despise the body. So they said basically anything that happens in the body is evil. It's, it's, we don't have to worry about that because we, we only are concerned with the spiritual life, okay? Jesus didn't come in the body, they say. Yeah. Now, John starts by saying that which we have seen, which we have heard, yeah. which our hands okay. have handled, we touched the body of Jesus. Yeah. We were with him concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we were witnesses to his humanity. Mm -hmm. the, the divine son of God 
came to dwell in a human body, okay? And then he says, he goes on to say, now, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Yeah. We can say we don't deceive, deceive anyone else, <laughs> but we deceive ourselves yeah. and the truth is not in us. Mm -hmm. But if we confess our sins, yeah. he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. Yeah. Now, we did that, Ben, wow. when we came to Christ. Mm -hmm. We confessed, Lord, I'm a sinner. I have many sins. Please forgive me and cleanse me. And that's what he did. Mm -hmm. He cleansed us from all unrighteousness. So in that first chapter, John is addressing Gnostics mm -hmm. who were saying sin's not a problem. Mm -hmm. And John was saying, if you say that, you can't be saved. You've got to acknowledge you have sin and you need a saviour. Now, in the next chapter, chapter he's, yeah, chapter two, he's now addressing Christians. Mm -hmm. And he says, my little children, these things I write to you because your sins are forgiven. forgiven. So wow. all our sins have been forgiven. So in chapter one, in that one chapter there where he speaks about confessing sins, he's addressing these Gnostics that were really troubling the church at that time, by the way. Yeah. Now, here's another question. If we really believe, in fact, two questions. Mm -hmm. If we really believe that we have to confess every sin to be forgiven, who can really say they've confessed every sin? I couldn't. Who can say I've confessed every wrong thought, word and deed that I'm ever guilty of? Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be very tiring to, to go through that exercise. Now, some people say, well, keep short accounts with God. <laughs> so at the end of every day, make sure you confess all your sins of that day. My question is, supposing you have a heart attack at 12 o'clock midday, what about those sins that you have not confessed? Before you confess. Too, too, too late, you know, too bad. Too, too, it's just not going to happen. One sin will keep you out of heaven, yeah. okay? If, if our forgiveness is dependent upon our confession, then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, there's only one thing that can cleanse us. You know, we sing the hymn, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And so we look to Jesus, his blood, and we have faith in him, and he has cleansed us from all sin. Now, the second question I would ask, mm -hmm. those who say that confession is necessary in order to be forgiven, why didn't the apostle Paul in 13 epistles that he wrote, ever mention that once. Wow. Wouldn't you think that's a serious omission? This a great apostle who gave us the full understanding of the gospel and yet he left out that we need to confess our sins to be forgiven? Mm -hmm. Ben is based only on that one isolated verse after the cross mm -hmm. and that verse was addressed to Gnostics, not to believers. Mm -hmm. We have been forgiven all our sins wow. when we believed in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's the good news. Wow, that is good news. And I believe that is not the gospel. Amen. That is the gospel. And it's so liberating mm. because, you know, the issue of confession of sins has brought about the, the, you know, people say that you have to confess the sins of omission and the sins of commission. But now it is clear that yeah. our forgiveness is not based on our confession because as a matter of fact, I don't know there, if there is anyone who can fully confess your sins. And something else Pastor Ken has told us is that uh, all our sins, when Christ died, they were in the future. Mm. And Christ is not coming to die again. <laughs> and he shed his blood, and it is through the blood of Jesus that we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. Uh, you've also mentioned something very important there about uh, the cross. You've mentioned the cross. Mm. And I've heard you say statements of, after the cross, after the cross, after yeah. the cross. What is so important for us to understand when it comes to the cross? The cross is the great dividing line, Ben, between the old covenant yeah. and the new covenant. Now, under the old covenant, they had to offer sacrifices that pointed forward to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So they looked forward in faith. So they were, their faith was looking forward. Yeah. <laughs> but where were they? They were on the outside of the tabernacle. They could not enter in, yeah. you see. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a veil and um, there was <laughs> God on one side of the veil, yeah. the people on the other side. That represent, represented the, what religion does. It mm -hmm. keeps you on the outside. Mm 
Mm. In fact, it's just go back to this confession thing. You say, how did they deal with their sin in, under the old covenant? They kept on offering sacrifices. Every sin, another sacrifice. Every sin, another sacrifice. Every year on the Day of Atonement, another sacrifice. So these sacrifices brought about a reminder of sins. Yeah. So they gave a sin consciousness. That's what religion does. And that's what coming back to this thing of confession, whether it's the Catholics going to the priest or whether it's us going in, in our quiet time and trying to confess every sin, we are reminding ourselves of sin and we're sin conscious. Mm -hmm. God does not want us to have a sin consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, God wants us to have a righteousness consciousness. Wow. We are righteous. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, how foolish it would be that God would want us, uh, God would want to forgive us everything but not want us to feel forgiven. That's crazy, isn't it, Ben? That's awesome. You know, that's God is not like that. God has not only um, forgiven us, mm -hmm. he's sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts yeah. to bear witness to our forgiveness and our sonship. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say, oh, but the Holy Spirit uh, convicts us of sin. Oh, yeah. No, he doesn't. Again, context is king. Let's look at what that passage really says. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, when he... The spirit of truth has come. He will convict the world, the world, the world of sin. sin yeah. Why? Because they do not believe in me. He said. So that's it's the not sin. For those who believe, no. those who will not be convicted. Of that's sin. right. It's the world. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. So he's not the convictor to us. He's the comforter. Mm -hmm. The devil is the convictor. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. But God promises this under the old. Uh, sorry, under the new covenant. He says this: their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Wow. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that God has a mental block out when he says, I, I can't remember their sins? No, God is omniscient. He knows all things. What that term means is I will remember against them no more. I will never bring up sin to my people again. It's dealt with. It's done. And so the blood of Jesus witnesses to the Father that we are righteous, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit has been sent into our hearts to witness to us that we are sons of God, Amen. that we are forgiven. Wow. So God wants us not only to know that we are forgiven, but to feel we're forgiven, not to have sin consciousness, mm -hmm. which they did under the old covenant, but to have a righteousness consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is how... God helps us also to overcome guilt and condemnation. Yes, so amen. Sometimes we, we, we feel guilty. Yeah. Sometimes our hearts condemn us. We yes. Like we are being condemned. But when we understand that God wants us to uh, not just to know that we are forgiven, but to also feel. So it's also a feeling yeah. of that I am forgiven. Yeah. Wow, wow. Because, you know, I mean, look, the, the conscience we're talking is what we're talking about here, the conscience. Yeah. We feel guilt because of our conscience. We have a, we call it a guilty conscience. Yeah. Now, what is the conscience? The, con the conscience reports to us on our moral condition, mm -hmm. our behavior. Yeah. But it can only report accurately if it's been informed correctly. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. So if we've been misinformed, and this is what religion does, we have a, a guilty conscience when there's no need to have a guilty conscience. And so when we're correctly informed, then we change. We, we don't feel that condemnation. The conscience speaks to us, but we see that the blood speaks to God. Wow. And that's what we start to look at. You can say that the, again. Yeah. The, the conscience, conscience speaks, speaks to, to us, <laughs> but the blood speaks, speaks to God. To God. Wow. In fact, the Bible puts it this way in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. The blood of Abel, sorry, the blood of Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? There's a law, Ben, that the first mention of any subject in the Bible gives us the seed of the understanding of that subject as we go through the Scripture. Yeah. Now, the first time the blood is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 4 when God came to Cain and said, what have you done? Where's your brother? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So there we see the blood speaks to God. The blood speaks to God. That's the key. Now, in the book of Hebrews, we read that the blood of Jesus speaks better things mm -hmm. than that of Abel. Wow. The blood of Abel was crying out for judgment upon Cain, crying out for revenge. Mm -hmm. But the blood of Jesus is 
giving testimony to our righteousness oh, wow. and the fact that all our sins were placed upon Jesus by his blood, he has paid the price for those sins. Hallelujah. So the blood is speaking to God. Praise we look God. to the blood. Praise God. Amen. Wow, I'm excited about the blood of Jesus. Amen. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't know whether it is happening in Australia and other countries out there, but uh, the blood of Jesus also has been misused, I think. Mm. I don't know whether it has been misused because uh, we have had prayers like, I sprinkle the blood of Jesus over my car. I sprinkle the blood of Jesus over my, my children, yeah. over my house. What do you say about that? Sprinkling yeah. the blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do have that in Australia as well. Okay. Now, um, the blood is for one specific purpose, yeah. the cleansing of sin, okay? The blood was shed for the cleansing of sin. Now, Jesus protects us, but we don't plead the blood and get superstitious about the blood. Ben, there's a couple of things that have helped me because you, you spoke about all these wrong teachings that constantly come into the church. Mm -hmm. Here in Africa, yeah. we have it also in Australia. Right. There's two things that have helped me in my ministry mm -hmm. because maybe some people that are listening and watching this program today, maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not a Bible teacher like you, so how can I know these things? Here are two things that will help you. Mm -hmm. Number one, when you hear a doctrine, ask yourself, did the apostles ever practice this? Mm -hmm. We have in the book of Acts, okay, in the book of Acts, did they ever practice this doctrine? The book of Acts gives us a record of the first 30 years of church history. Yeah. Now, in the first 30 years of church history, did the apostles ever teach us or practice sprinkling the blood for protection? <laughs> did, can, you, can you show me one reference where they did? No, you can't. It is not there. Okay, so let's go to the second question. In all the epistles, which are in our instructions for Christian living, did they ever once instruct us to sprinkle blood on our homes, on our children, on our cars or whatever? No, they didn't. So what we have is a doctrine of man. We can reject it. Okay, so that's helped me a lot and I know it's helped a lot of people. Did the apostles practice this? Did they teach it? Wow. If the answer is no, reject it. It's a doctrine of man. Wow. So... Two things have been mentioned there, my viewer. Two very major and very important things that for you to understand or to know whether something is right or it is doctrinal, number one, did the apostles practice it? And where do we know whether they, pra they practiced it? It's yeah. in the book of Acts. We look at the book of Acts, whether it was practiced. Then secondly, was it taught as an instruction for Christian living in the epistles? So if it mm. is not... It was not practiced by the apostles and it was not taught by the apostles in their epistles, then it is not the doctrine of Christ. Mm. Wow, wow. Yeah. That is so good. So the, the other question I'd like us to maybe to, to look into, uh, we've talked about what is the gospel. Yeah. And uh, now as a preacher, what should be my... My, what should be the results of preaching the gospel? What should, I, what should I expect as I preach the gospel? Well, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. Now, um, we need to be very simplistic in our approach to mission, evangelism, and ministry. God is very simplistic. We've complicated it. We're looking for techniques. We're looking for gimmicks. We're looking for formulas to get us there. God's uh, formula, if I can use that term, is very simple. Preach God's word, trust God's spirit. Mm -hmm. That's it. You do your part. Preach God's word, preach the gospel, or if you're not a preacher, witness the gospel, share your testimony, trust the Holy Spirit. Our job is not to persuade the results of God's. As Paul said, um, I have sown Apollos waters, but it's God who gives the increase. Now, we should see lives being changed, being transformed. And incidentally, we don't just preach the gospel to the unsaved. Mm -hmm. We constantly preach the gospel to God's people because uh, we can't go beyond the gospel, but we can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into what Christ has done for us and learn the benefits, or as uh, Paul calls it, the, the riches of God's grace that are given to us freely in Jesus Christ. Just keep preaching the gospel, trusting God's spirit. Mm -hmm. The results are his. Wow. Yeah. You say something very important, that we cannot go beyond the gospel, yeah. but we can get deeper and deeper and mm. deeper. Wow, that is interesting. Yeah. And uh, uh, 
maybe to to elaborate on that i would like you have said we we preach the gospel and trust the, the, holy, the spirit. holy spirit yeah so uh what is the essence of the holy spirit in the all this what is the essence of all how does how does he help us well the holy spirit is the one who works in the hearts mm -hmm. of other people paul put it you know in this way that um i've sown another one waters by keep on preaching the word that's our job it's to sow the seed mm -hmm. but it's the holy spirit who does the work inside people and brings revelation of Jesus Christ. So eyes are open, spiritual eyes are open. People begin to understand these other things that we've been talking about, all the seed sowing and uh, the money business and curses and all that sort of stuff. People just part with all that because they can see the Holy Spirit reveals to them, this is not the truth. This is not what the apostles did. And then they hear the gospel and they trust in the gospel. Paul said this, that he was concerned for the Corinthians lest they should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Mm -hmm. The gospel is so simple that a small child can believe it. An uneducated person can believe it and benefit and enjoy the riches of Christ. So the Holy Spirit comes and opens our understanding. It's not an intellectual thing, Ben. It's not something you can learn really in a classroom. It's something that is in the Word of God that the Holy Spirit reveals to us. We preach the Word, we teach the Word, we speak the Word, but God gives the increase by opening up people's lives. Okay. Wow. The, we preach the gospel, we trust the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit now unveils this whole thing. It is not about our mental or our comprehension mentally. Yeah. It's not about trying to understand the gospel with our mind, yeah. because it is beyond our mind. Amen. But yet again, you see that it is so simple that even a young kid can understand it. Yeah. It is so simple that even the old men can understand it. Yeah. Uh, for some time, we've seen a gospel. Okay, let me say, uh, gospel in quotes that has been preached that there is a certain message that people preach that if you preach this same message to a certain uh, to another group of people that message will be irrelevant uh -huh. because like they say there is a message to the young people there is a message to the rich people there is a message to the poor there is a message to different sects of people yeah. and they realize that the message to the young people cannot be preached to the old people and uh, sometimes it's even confusing. Should we be having one message <laughs> or different messages for different uh, sets of people? No, there's, there's one message, one gospel. Now, of course, the way we share it will be different okay. because the way we speak to children is the way we different, speak uh, differently to adults. Yeah. So, you know, some people can communicate with children better than those who communicate with adults, okay? So we all have different gifts and different ministries but the gospel is the same. Let me give you an example. Uh, Paul and Peter had the same ministry. They were both apostles. Yeah. They both shared the same message, mm -hmm. but they had a different ministry. Okay. Peter communicated with the Jews. Paul knew how to communicate with the Gentiles. So they, they connected to their groups according to their callings and ministry, but it was the same message. And that's very clear because when... Paul met up with Paul, uh, sorry, with Peter and James and the others. They compared notes. They compared the gospel and they saw that they were both preaching the same gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, wonderful. I believe my viewers are still uh, with us and you're still watching this program. And uh, you are hearing for yourself what the Lord is saying concerning the church and concerning the, the gospel. Well, Pastor Ken Leg is, as he said, he's from Australia. He teaches the gospel. He's from the church called New Beginnings Church. And he has written several books, right? Yes. You have written several books. I've read uh, almost all the books. <laughs> there is the, the, the New Covenant, New Glory. New Covenant, New Glory. There is, this is the life. Then we have, uh, there is another book. And I wanted to ask a question from that book. Okay. Then there is Tetelestai. Yes. Then we have uh, Grace Roots. Grace Roots and Grace the Power, power to Rain. Yeah. Then there is this other one which is called uh, It's Not What You Eat That's Making You Sick. Yeah. Right? Am I right? Yes. It's What's Eating You. That's right. So, the, the, the short title is What's Eating You. <laughs> what's eating but the long title is It's Not What You Eat That's Making You Sick, But What's Eating You. Yeah. And that is the book yeah. I wanted to ask you about that title, about that. That uh, the conversation that goes on there, mm. and I want you to elaborate on 
that that it's not what you eat that make that's making you sick. Yeah. But it's what's eating you. Yeah. So what is the the whole idea about that? that yeah. Thing? Well, the, basically, it's um, addressing what's in our heart. Mm -hmm. Now, it is a fact that uh, some doctors say seventy percent of all sicknesses are psychosomatic. Mm -hmm. In other words, the state of the mind is affecting the health of the body. And so we get all these sicknesses that are a result of the things that are churning around inside us that are unresolved. Yeah. Uh, people struggle with unresolved hurts from the past. They struggle with this thing called guilt. In fact, psychologists say that guilt is the number one killer. Mm -hmm. Some people have been abused in the past. Some people have been, um, uh, addicts, you know, addicted to various problems, but never really understood the root of that addiction. And all these things are unresolved. That's why the Bible actually talks so much about the human heart. Mm -hmm. If you get a concordance and go through and see how many times the Bible mentions the heart, you'll be surprised. Yeah. So it's not what you eat that's making you sick, but what's eating you? What's going on inside your heart? You know, what are the problems that are causing you real hangups? How did they get there? Mm -hmm. And what's God's way of dealing with them? God is very practical. He wants to free us from fear, from anxiety, from depression, from unforgiveness, from bitterness, and all those things that are negative emotions impacting upon us in our health, in our walk, and so on. Wow. Yeah. So it's what's eating you. Yeah. But now God wants us to live a whole life. Yeah, God wants, to, God wants us to bring it to him and to be free of those things. There's wonderful freedom and healing, both physically, emotionally, as well as spiritually. There's, there's wonderful healing in God. And that's what we encourage people to do, is to come and bring it to Jesus. For example, Ben, you know, a lot of people can talk about um, marriage problems. Mm -hmm. A lot of people struggle with, um, m you know, problems within their marriage. They're living close up to one, with one another every day, and there's clashes, and and sometimes those things can fester and they can become big problems. And then they go for marriage counselling. Mm -hmm. And that counselling can take weeks, sometimes months. But you can short -cut circuit that. Mm -hmm. You know, just say two words and you don't need 12 weeks of counselling. Just humble yourself and say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. See, we talk about marriage problems, but really there are no marriage problems. They're sin problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Jesus helps us to learn how to behave. You know, he, he changes us. He doesn't just forgive us, but he transforms us. That's what your ministry is about, beholding Christ yeah. and being transformed by, be, by beholding him. Yeah. And uh, so we just encourage people to get out of this, uh, uh, what can we say, this prison mm -hmm. of emotions that are really strangling them. Wow. It's not what you eat that's making you sick, but what's eating you? Bring it to the Lord and we show them how to do that. Wow. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And as we 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 are almost wrap, wrapping it up, yeah. I would like you to mention about uh, the the spirit, soul, and body, mm. because uh, most people are confused that when the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's mm. a new creature. Yeah. Which part of me <laughs> is the new creature? Because I thought when I received the gospel and believed, I would feel like there are some things happening. And I know someone is asking that question. I thought like. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I was dark, I would become lighter, or yeah, things would <laughs> change instantly, maybe on my outside. So which part of me, and uh, I know there's this verse in the Thessalonians that talks about spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. So maybe you can elaborate on that about yeah. how, which part of me became new, and what about the other parts? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, let's say this. We are unique. As human beings, we are unique for this reason, that we are body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, plant life has body. Uh, animals have body and soul. Mm -hmm. We have body, soul, and spirit. Yeah. Why is that? Because God created us that he might indwell us. Mm -hmm. And that's how God created Adam, until Adam disobeyed. We know the story. And he sinned. And when he sinned, God vacated the human spirit and the soul was plunged into darkness. Yeah. Okay. Now, when we're born again, when we receive Christ as Saviour, we're born again, which means that Christ comes back to live inside us. Mm -hmm. So we, he now can influence the way that we live. Now, getting back to your question, because I know our time is running out here. Um, 
Which part of us is saved? Body, soul, spirit. God, Jesus died to save all of us. Mm -hmm. But there's a part of us that's not yet saved, and that's the body. Yeah. We will be saved. The Bible speaks about the redemption of the body. Yeah. But now our spirit is perfected. We are complete in Christ. Mm -hmm. We are 100% righteous, okay? And we live from that righteousness here on earth in this body, and it determines the way that we make our decisions, the way that we live our lives, and the way that we relate to one another. Mm -hmm. It's a big subject, but um, if we have more time, maybe next time we next can time enlarge upon that. We'll look for another time yeah. when you come in. Uh, I know that is a big a big subject about yeah. spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. And uh, now, because our time is far much gone, I want us to stop at that point. And uh, I thank you so much for, for being with us. But I would thank like you. you to tell the viewers uh, how we can reach you, your ministry. I know you have an online Bible school. That is yes, now. yes, so we you do. You can tell us about it, your ministry, mm. your YouTube, mm. or how we can get your resources. Okay, yes. just very briefly, we do have a free online Bible school. It's called uh, www.onlinegracebibleschool.com mm -hmm. um, and it's free. So lots of people all around the world are studying with our Bible school. Secondly, you, I do have a YouTube channel. Just simply go to Ken Leg or, or Ken on, in the search, Ken Leg in YouTube, and you'll find about 400 messages there. But also I have my own website, www.kenleg.com. .au. I'd love to hear from you. Wow. Yeah. And I, will end us, uh, I will end this with a joke that you usually give us. That we should <laughs> not call you broken leg because you're not broken leg. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Thank you for having you. I'm it's excited. been a pleasure. Yes, yes, Thank yes. you. And I hope next time, again, when you come back to Kenya, uh, we'll have another show. For sure. Together we'll have another interview with you. Yeah. And I'm delighted. And uh, I believe for the next remaining part of the, the conference, that the days that are remaining for the conference, I believe you'll have a wonderful time. Thank you very much, Ben. So thank you very much God for bless joining you. us. We are blessed. So my viewers, that has been Pastor Kenleg, all the way from uh, Australia. In, he's the lead pastor in uh, New Beginnings Church, and he's a blessing. So you can go to his YouTube channel. It's Kenleg or www.kenleg.com. Dot .au. Dot .au, yeah. and uh, you'll get all his resources. Thank you for tuning in. This is Christ Beholders of Beholding Christ uh, show, and my name is Ben Peter, and I am so blessed, and you are so blessed for being with us. Thank you very much. Stay tuned, and you are blessed, because indeed, in Christ, you are blessed. Amen, and amen, and amen. Thank you.